Hi, this is lecture 8 of Marketing Analytics. For this lecture, we are going to explore marketing management's retail tracking and consumer behavior analytics and look at how sampling statistics can be used to track retail uh, tracking in purchases of our consumers. Now, for this particular lecture, we hope to understand the difference between aggregated and disaggregated data in retail tracking, understand how disaggregate and or outlet level or what we call consumer level data <clears throat> gives more diagnostic retail tracking relationship between the customer transaction and the sales data. We also hope to understand the statistical concept of sampling with regards to consumer and transaction sales. Now, retail tracking or how sales is tracked is basically looked at a few things. Firstly, we can usually track the sales from polling the data from the manufacturers to the retail outlets. This is of course a very low cost, however unreliable method because by looking at how the retail stock the manufacturing brands would not necessarily translate into sales data from the customers. This is where the aggregated data comes from. But if we look at the retail index, measuring the pipeline between the retail stores to the shoppers, then we might be able to see a more efficient and accurate method of measuring the monitoring market movements from the retail to the shoppers. And if we want to be really, really richer in terms of our data yields and insights, then we might want to look at the individual shoppers alone by looking into a consumer panel, measuring the purchases brought home by the buyers. And this of course will be the best way to track the retail tracking and the sales transaction. Now retail analytics falls into three big universes. The analysis of continuous outlet level transaction and also the shopper data to address the business issue. So you may have three groups that fulfills uh, conditions for three different groups. So the continuous outlet level transaction and shopper data is invaluable to the retailers and the marketeers. So using the combination of aggregate metrics whereby we look at market share, sales and distribution across the whole business, example using retail index. But we can also complement this by using disaggregate data that can help diagnose and address business issue at the outlet level or even the shopper level using a form of what we call the consumer panel. Breaking down the sales data have to be in terms of retail index as we saw in the last lecture in terms of the distribution of the stores where you get your width as well as the rate of sales per store in terms of the depth. So the sales from last lecture is the number of stores distributing the brand times the sales per store. But we can also break down this data by looking at the penetration of homes, looking at the percentage of buying from the consumer panel from the volume per buyer in terms of depth. So the penetration of buying homes will, uh, of homes will give you the width and the volume per buyer will give you the depth. So this is where you get the sales numbers, number of homes buying times the volume per buyer. There are many ways to track the retail uh, measurements by either looking at the cards that they use to purchase, the tracking S uh, POS scanner, the uh, point of sale service, using the uh, cameras by tracking and also using the mobile app. Retail tracking databases are used primarily for retail analytics. The point of sale scan terminals at the retail outlets for the continuous transaction databases can feed into the retail analytics database. And you can 
either aggregate the data to capture the market size, the share and the distribution over time because retail analytics can diagnose the disaggregate or outlet level data. However, by filtering out the outlet levels to form outlet groups, make the sales comparisons between the outlets who stocked the brand and those who didn't, or even the outlets who offered promotions and those who didn't. So retail um, and outlet, sorry, outlet uh, data is very imp uh, uh, useful when it comes to comparison. So for example, if let's say we want to drill down the relevant data to evaluate a particular outlet, we can look at the handler's analysis, whereby we can see outlets filtered according to whether a stock that they, uh, they, they stocked a product or any combination of a products to see whether sales has increased for that particular product. We can also look at the assortment analysis for an outlet, example, outlets that stocked one or two models of a particular TV, or even three to six or even outlets that stock more to see a comparison of whether more stocking of models increased sales. We can also look at brand overlap, example, outlets that only distribute a particular soda like Coca-Cola and versus outlets that only distribute Pepsi and also in comparison with outlets that stocked both the uh, sodas Coca-Cola and Pepsi. You might also want to look at outlet grouping. For example, if let's say we want to look at shelf space analysis, example breakfast cereals categories, outlets where they have less than 10% forward stock and outlets uh, uh, in comparison with outlets that have more than 10% of forward stock of a certain category of health cereals. Pricing, we can also check and compare outlets where group stores according to the average price of comparative pricing, where stores, example, stores where Pantene shampoo is cheaper than Sunsilk, or when stores where uh, Pantene is more expensive than Sunsilk. We can also look at promotion grouping, whereby we look at uh, groups of outlets where promoted the RON92 fuel and that comparison with those that did not promote it. We might also look at the rate of sales in comparison of the sales uh, volume. So we can see and compare whether or not um, outlets that had more sales activity had better uh, turnover compared to outlets that didn't have uh, much of sales uh, or light on its sales activity. So giving you a case would be Will and Nirma pricing analysis, whereby they had different pricing. Now, Nirma is a, is a detergent launched in 1969 in India, also, and it's a very low cost detergent power. Nirma brand was uh, launched by a chemist named uh, Karsanbhai Patel, whereas the direct competitor is Wheel, launched in 1988 in India as a fragrant low-cost detergent powder. So these two are actually uh, quite the um, competitors. So Wheel is actually one of the brands under the Hindustani Unilever uh, Limited uh, uh, company uh, offering detergents. Okay, so Will and Nima, as I mentioned, are direct competitors in the low price segment of the Indian detergent bar market. So what we want to see here is how does relative price impact market share of the two? So looking into this case example between Will and Nima, who are direct competitors, we notice that both the brands are about 30% uh, share in the total market of the detergent, although wheel is slightly a bit higher. And then we also notice that stores where wheels prices are cheaper, here is 8.97 versus 9.40, the brand's value share increases to 34% for near wheel as compared to 29.2%, probably because of uh, consumers' perception of the uh, product. We also noticed in terms of volume 
that in stores where uh, wheels um, prices is higher than Nirma, we notice that the um, sorry where wheels prices is higher than Nirma, we notice that the um, volume is higher in terms of 31.6 as compared to Nirma is 45.3 and where the prices are up to 10% there is 36.4 in terms of volume share it is actually lesser but in prices where Wheel and Nirma is supposed to be equally the same yeah or less than we notice that the shares of uh, wheel is higher as compared to Nirma. So what this means is if there is already a perception that your price is supposed to be at the same level or less than a particular competitor by increasing the price you would definitely have an effect on your volume sales. So the perception in the consumer's mind is that if a price is higher than a competitor of the same standing, therefore it would not make sense for the consumer to pay. So playing around with the pricing would definitely give you an indication of how the consumers will react to the outlet and the retail uh, comp competition uh, between the brands. So customer transaction database for retail analytics uh, is important because we're trying to look at sales transaction from data uh, and also consumer panel data by looking at loyalty panel data, which also can feed into the retail analytics. Now, by checking out databases, we use database looking at the outlet dimension plus the customer dimension to give you a good picture of chain outlet penetration, spend per customer, chain loyalty, and also give you a great picture of the cannibalization among the outlets. You can do this by using a variety of tools, putting together market basket analysis, RFM, decision tree, and cluster analysis. This is how we can then be fully tracking the consumer panels to find out what is their um, purchasing habits like. So what is a consumer panel in research methodology? This is very different from a focus group. A focus group basically is a one-time uh, group interview to use in um, uh, qualitative research for us to find a fresh perspective from that group. However, a customer panel is used for ongoing research, whereby we see a panel of household or individuals whose purchases are monitored on a continuous or ongoing basis. So some of the type of panels you can see here are FMCG panels, household purchases bought into the homes. You can look at financial services in terms of credit card holders and usage, telecom panels, usage of telecom services, motorist panels of fuel consumption, and impulse or outdoor purchase panels to measure FMCG categories like chocolates, sugars, and soft drinks. Consumer panels can be broken down in terms of finding out their sales by looking into two components. Number one is the number of buyers uh, times the population, which is the width. The width is represented by the buyer base. How many percentage of buyers that uh, purchase the product in a given period of time? And then the depth is by taking the volume of each of the buyer buys in terms of that specific time. So how much does one buyer actually buy? So the volume can also be broken down into two, which is the frequency of the purchase, number of purchase occasions per buyer, and also volume per 
per occasion. That means it's not just volume per buying for a time period, but also per occasion, times that occasion. Now, if you look at a example here, uh, percentage of buyer versus the volume of buyer, there are two different ways to see uh, consumer panel buying behavior tracking, uh, retail tracking. Compared to the health food drink, tea has a smaller base of buyer. As you can see here, tea is 41%, whereas health food drink is 73%. However, in terms of volume per buyer, tea outnumbers the number of cups for the health food drink, 391 to 167. So it really depends on whether you are looking at width or whether you're looking at depth. But if you want to look at the total sales from a consumer panel point of view, you must always use the percentage of buyers times the volume per buyer to get your sales numbers. Yeah, just like as we did for the brand um, sales uh, in the last lecture. Now, breaking down the volume per buyer, for example, volume per buyer can be broken down further into number of purchase trips and volume per trip. So for example, if let's say there are uh, 121 cups per trip times 3.2 purchases occasions, so you have 391 and then 41% of homes bought tea during that year. So 391 times 1 million homes of 41%, then you have 160 million cups all together. So there are 41% out of the 1 million homes. So a review of percentage of buyers, volume per buyer, purchase trips, and volume per trip trends over time reveals whether the width or the depth of purchases is contributing to the growth or the decline of a brand. The consumer panel can also give you segmenting according to their purchasing behavior. For example, the store choice of shopper segment. See heavy drinkers, then the medium drinkers and the light drinkers. We can also see what is the volume contribution. Obviously, in the heavy drinkers, we see the highest contribution. And of course, the lowest, the light drinkers gives you the lowest contribution. So you need to expand the knowledge on buyer groups so that you can also track to see where are the people or the consumer groups that is likely to have brand switching if you do not retain them properly. Now, what is brand switching? Brand switching is, of course, a measure of competitive shifts in consumer buying in terms of amount of business each brand gains from each other brand. Now, in marketing terms, we also call this churn. So the methodology to understand about churn is to measure the gains and losses of sales of each brand in the time periods. So for example, if you have time period one, which is three months before, and time period two, which is three months after, you want to look at the purchasing behavior three months versus three months after, so that you can see whether or not in the same group of household of consumer panel, the buying behavior has changed. And if it has changed for the decline, then you will notice that this consumer panel has slowly begun to um, gear towards churn. And this is where, as a marketing person, you need to find out why they are going to churn and what are the things that you can do to stop this churning. It could be sales promotion, it could be bundling, it could be more customer service. Now, giving you an example here would be looking at a gain loss analysis to track brand switching. So, for example, if let's say there is uh, several cases of brand switching, let's take it the first one. If let's say from the first uh, uh, quarter, I have bought Dove and then the second quarter I bought Lux, which means that I have switched 
And this is what we mean by switching loss. The consumers have shifted some of their purchase from one brand to another brand. Of course, the ideal thing would be increase the buying. That means the market penetration has not just penetrated but expanded. Or it could be a decreased buying where there is a drop in the purchases due to decrease in household purchases of the body wash. Now, it could be also that you uh, attract new buyers or we call it new buyer uh, purchases or it could be that you have lost the buyer <clears throat> in terms of purchases due to those households that previously bought wash that now no longer buys body wash. Maybe they found an alternative brand or maybe they found an alternative solution. With all these, you need to then understand the reasons between the change from gain loss from one quarter to the other quarter and put in place the marketing uh, strategy to retain your uh, buyers and also to uh, decrease your potential for switch. Now, using the analysis of transaction at the customer level data can help you to track these transactions. So for example, we can start with the analysis in the restricted context of the retailer customers and the traction in the retailer's outlets. So track what the customer is doing with the brand in the particular retailer or outlet. Now, in the FMCG sector, the consumer panels provide a very holistic view of the market, but expensive to set up and maintain. Hence, unless we use a sample, there is no way we can survey all the consumers that shop at that particular outlet. This would tend to be relatively small compared to the sales transaction or loyalty panel data. A profile analysis provides an understanding of the importance of each group in terms of the transaction value. So, for example, if let's say we want to do a quick analysis on behavioral loyalty and retailer propensity. Example, how much milk market share does retail chain actually have? Now, the total market size of the retail chain A is about 1 million. Milk shoppers tend to spend a total of 300 million across all retail chains. So those milk shoppers of this amount of 300 million, 100 million is spent on buying milk in chain A. So this means that behavioral loyalty to chain A for milk would be 120 over 300, which is 40%. Now, in theory, if the loyalty rose to 100%, that means retail chain A can theoretically make money out of their milk sales to shoppers amounting to 300 million. Now, the strategy for this can happen if they increase more store traffic and or the amount that they spend on the category of milk. To calculate the retail propensity, which is the proportion of all the milk shoppers coming from retail chains A shoppers. So you notice that all the milk shoppers is 300 million and therefore retail chain A has about 1 billion of market size. So how much does milk shoppers contribute to the propensity of the retailer, which is 300 million, divide over 1 billion, which is 30%. Now we can put the behavioral loyalty and the retailer propensity together to get a good number of market share, which is the propensity of the shoppers to shop for milk multiplied by the behavioral loyalty of the shoppers. 0 0.3 times 0 0.4 times 100, you get a market share of 12% of retail chain A on the milk market. Retail analytics looks into how we can then 
use this behavioral loyalty and retail propensity and uh, for uh, the benefit of the retailer. However, this loyalty and propensity cannot be computed with data that is confined only to the retailer's own transactions, as it is a case with loyalty date panel data. You have to look at it across all, retail sec uh, all the retailers. So both of these measures requirements and assessments of the customer's transaction across the entire market. Sampling can help with that. So what is sampling? Sampling is just basically a subset of the universe that's used for making conclusions or inferences about the universe. Since we can't take the whole, uh, uh, all the uh, consumers in the retail universe, we can just use a subset. We can also think about sampling as helping us reduce time, effort and cost in estimating parameters such as marketing size, market size, sorry, a brand sales volume or market share. Now, the sample size is usually a commercial decision weighing the cost and the benefit. It is small, small unreliable samples are not so meaningful, but large and overly accurate samples that none can afford also do not make commercial sense. So you have to balance out in what is a good sample. So sample size determination in market analytics really depends on the population variability. If there is a large variance in the behavioral variance, then you need a larger sample to represent the population. The product distribution also will give you an idea. If let's say there are too many products, then you might need to have a bigger sample. Sample design also can affect the ideal results that you want. For example, optimum stratification and allocation, selection and also projection of the results that you want. In terms of level of accuracy, there's always a thing in the statistics whereby they say the higher required accuracy, therefore the larger the sample is required. Sample size is of course not determined dependent on the uh, universe of the size. So why are large samples in large populations? Why do we need large samples in large populations? Well, First off, if let's say you have a retail environment that's highly variable and a product distribution which is low, then it is going to be very difficult to measure. You definitely then need a large sample because with a low dis product distribution, that means that you will have to pick out as many possible uh, uh, retail outlets that distribute that product in order for you to get a good accurate idea. So reliability to get this sample uh, reliable results is actually more expensive if you have these two conditions of high variable retail environment and low product. So sampling can uh, predominantly be broken down into two types. One is probability sampling and the other one is non-probability sampling. Now, in probability sampling is more widely used in statistics because they yield more highly uh, uh, um, accurate results, especially when it comes to uh, statistical inferences. So you can start out with either a simple random sampling where every single unit in the population has the same chance of being sampled. You can also look at stratified sampling whereby you have a uh, a formula to sample, for example, every third respondent within a population. You can also choose stratified sampling where you um, group the population into meaningful groups like gender or age or even ethnicity. And then within each of the groups of the strata, you take a particular sample using simple random sampling. Or you can also group in terms of cluster of locations. Like for example, in retail tracking, you can cluster it by geographical outlet. And therefore within the cluster, you can take, for example, clusters of um, uh, normal uh, distrib uh, clusters of uh, distribution of your panel. Now, 
Stratified sample and cluster samples are actually opposites of each other. Stratified sample basically are homogeneous within the group and heterogeneous between the groups. Whereas the cluster sample is a, each cluster represents a microscope of the population and therefore it is heterogeneous within the group but it is homogeneous between the groups. So non-probability sampling as opposed to probability sampling is also very much used in market research and also retail tracking. Now for example for convenience you can start with convenience sampling whereby whatever respondents that is convenient to the researcher that researcher will approach those samples irregardless of whether they meet a criteria or not as opposed to voluntary response sample the researcher will put out a call for people to voluntarily come to the researcher to be sampled this probably could be given by an incentive so that people will come forward to the researcher in essence, there is also another one whereby the researcher has in mind the type of people that he or she wants to sample and therefore this person will go and find these people who meet these criteria of the purposive sample. So for example, it could be people who have bought milk in the past one week. So you really, really have to find people who have bought milk and show you evidence that they have done so to be able to answer your question. Another one would be judgmental sampling or we call it snowball sampling. Now snowball sampling is highly concentrated sampling whereby there is a very um, uh, a niche area that the researcher may not know who are the people that falls into these categories. So for example, if let's say I'm looking for specialists um, in, in retail, for example, and I do not know a lot of people who are specialists. So what I can do is I can start out with one contact and get that contact to introduce me to other contacts as well. So this process continues and snowballs until my sample size uh, requirement is met. So there are difference in samples give different results. There is the population size and then the sample size and then the true value. But based on the central limit theorem, as long as you have a large enough sample size, you should be able to create what we call a sampling distribution where is a combination of all the means of the different different samples and the mean of this sampling distribution will be as close as possible to the true value mean. So what this actually uh, entails is that it helps you to understand how much sample size is needed. So for example, if let's say the sampling distribution of the mean will approach a normal distributed uh, distribution as the sample size increases. So the higher the sample size, then the more that the sampling distribution of the, sam uh, of the uh, uh, sample uh, will, will become a normally distributed, even if it's even if the population distribution is not normally distributed. Now, although there are different samples, example retail outlets of the same sizes will yield a different results uh, of any variable, such as the rate of brand per store, it can however be expected that all the samples of the same size and design will yield a result that is within the measured range around the true value. So you don't have to worry about getting too much samples. As long as you have a decent amount of sample sizes, you should be able to cover use, uh, the true population mean using the central limit theorem. So this is a good representation of the whole picture. So have a good sample size based on good number of error that you want to get. But also you have to understand the margin of error based on what sample size you want. Now, 
creating a good margin of error will uh, having an, in mind a good margin of error will give you the kind of idea the number of uh, sample sizes you want for an estimated population mean. So for example, if let's say you have a sample size of small n and a variance of s, if let's say your level of confidence you want to increase, then hence your um, z value, which is a standardized z value for level of confidence, also need to increase. Now, the acceptable tolerance error would reduce significantly if your level of confidence is higher as stated in absolute value, which is the E. So you notice that the uh, higher your E, the lower your N. But if you want lower error, then higher your N, which is higher your sample size. That's just basically the relationship as you can see from this graph, the higher the sample, then the lower the margin of error. It has been said that if you want a good combination of margin of error in relation to the sample size, depending on what is the allowable, tolerable error that you can have, that would determine the number of sample sizes you are going to get. Now, design issues in tracking surveys, whereby you have track over time. Many market research surveys are tracking surveys in which an independent samples are taken at fixed intervals, which is kind of like panel uh, intervals in one um, cross section to the next cross section and the main objective of the tracker is to measure if there were changes in the behavior of the intervals this is what we call panel data but the estimates of the change uh, of differences have margins of error which are 40 percent larger than the corresponding estimates on the individual surveys which means that uh, the changes can be quite significant so in order, because both of the estimates are subject to sampling error, because you may not be sampling the same kind of people at the same time. So in tracking studies, the margin of error for differences will increase even significantly for the sample sizes as opposed to the cross-sectional data. Right? Now, this would mean that charts show tracking survey for which no chain was happening the population value did not change over time. Let's say the population value did not change. But if it changes, then this sampling error and this sample size would definitely change as well. So many trackers instead will have samples around 20 to 50 per wave, but are unable to measure the change happening in that population. So one of the ways to deal with this is to do what we call the rolling data. Now, the problem is often solved uh, when we roll the data, the result for each wave, and we average it across the current and the several previous waves. So for example, if we were to take the sales for three months, we use a moving average, and then the next three months, we roll it to move the moving average, and then the next three months, we roll it to move the moving average in terms of the previous waves, right? So an example, weekly sample of 25 per week on an eight week rolling average will give you a sample size of 200. This improves the standard error definitely by using more samples of the rolling, but taking into account the average uh, week flattens the data, making any change very hard to detect. So again, it comes back to a chicken and egg issue. Do you want a much more accurate uh, uh, answer or do you want a more substantial answer? So what are the key takeaways of this particular lecture? Retail analytics can be divided into analytics by outlet and also by consumers. Shelf space, pricing, promotion and sales frequency affect retail outlet analytics. 
consumer panels are a great way to encompass the idea behind understanding what buyer groups want, different sales components, and also brand switching analysis by looking at the width, which is percentage number of buyers, and then also going into depth, which is volume per buyer, and then further breaking down the volume per buyer by the occasion, and then for each occasion, how much they buy. So sampling of outlets and consumers can give you a big picture of retail analytics when you have no resources to sample a large number of your, analytic, of, of your retail tracking. Now, this tutorial for this lecture, I have something very interesting for you guys to do. I would like you to go to any retail store which is designated by your tutor, and I want you to choose a product sample. Hopefully you don't choose something too large, nor something that's too niche, because I want you to track the retail and the category management. So what you need to do is to conspicuously count how many product categories are there by taking pictures of each of the product category, note the prices and the stock of each of the category when you take the picture, and which category do you think is doing well and which ones are not making sure that you note the facings as well as whether or not it is out of stock and also the stock retail. Identify then, once you have got all this information, three strategies to increase the profitability of the product using category management and retail analytics techniques based on one particular product alone. Prepare this presentation to be presented to the whole class. As an additional reading, I would like you to read this article on marketing metrics, big data, and the role of marketing department. And I want you to explain from the journal what are the most effective metrics that can be applied to help businesses today recovering from the global pandemic. That ends this lecture for, for this, uh, this topic. The next lecture we are going to consider Big Data Analytics, focusing on what is big data, how data mining can be used to analyze big data, and also the uh, sophistication of artificial intelligence to um, facilitate big data analytics. Thank you.